October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. If you're listening to this, you may have listened to last week's episode and you know that I told my story. What you may not know is that I reached out to other survivors and asked them if they would like the opportunity to tell their story as well. Today, I'm going to tell the story of Rachel Hamilton. I will be her voice reading her story word for word as she submitted it to me. If you or someone you know are experiencing domestic violence, the number to the National Domestic Violence Hotline is one 800 799-SAFE. Everyone deserves a safe and healthy relationship. Hi, true crime fans. You're tuning into Coffee, Murder, and Mystery, a true crime podcast where we discuss murder, mystery, and the supernatural. Welcome back. I'm your host, Melissa Lancaster. If you listened to my last episode, you know that the domestic violence statistics are extremely alarming. The following account was provided to me by a survivor. These are the words of Rachel Hamilton. I do want to note before we start that the account she has provided me with is very detailed and could be triggering for those who have or are experiencing domestic violence. This is explicit content. I suppose I should have known the warning signs that were blatantly in my face when I made the poor choice to ignore the advice of my maternal grandmother and the handful of close girlfriends I had kept from home while I was in college. I didn't, though. Not for myself. Much like my own father, whose faults have haunted my life since conception, I could see the faults in others so well. Until those faults caused me to have to hold a mirror to my own face and look for my own misgivings or bad choices. Much of that behavior I attribute to emotional immaturity on both our parts, but I digress. Growing up, my life was such a series of secrets and contradictory social circumstances, an atmosphere which made the adult transition to hiding the abuse I faced at the hands of a man with a Napoleon complex much easier from my colleagues at work and my sorority sisters in college. However, my profession after college, and during for quite some time until graduation, and the training I received by both myself and my fellow officers made the abuse easy for them to spot. Yes, officers. I worked as a correctional officer for a state prison system while finishing my undergraduate degree, and then after graduation took a job with the sheriff's department in my hometown as a flex deputy, working corrections, dispatch, transport, and other non-patrol positions until I could start to work on licensure for the state in which the department is located. The license I received in college was only relevant in Texas, but sets the national standard. I really thought that all the training I had received made me somehow immune to abuse. Obviously, it did not do that. As a matter of fact, it gave my ex-husband what he saw as a free pass to get away with a laundry list of criminal activity, much in the same way my own father thought that my mother's position as a DCFS investigator gave him a free pass to commit his litany of crimes which merely led to his arrest and face on the front page of a local newspaper, more than once. My ex-husband not only participated in much of the illicit activity that led to my father's arrest, he did so under the pretense of taking our son to see his grandfather. My ex-husband has a very unique, difficult to pronounce for most, name, Talamage. So for the sake of ease in his account, I'll refer to him by the nickname his buddies and dads use for him, Tally. I'd known Tally since we were teenagers. He was close friends with two of my younger brothers, and our fathers were also business associates. Of a sort. Illegal business associates. In the meth-cooking business. 
My father owned a concrete contracting company, and his was a millwright for a large paper mill in town. So they used their business association with one another as a facade for their meth cooking and sales. I always knew that my father was in a biker gang. We don't say that to his face. It's a motorcycle club. And that his refusal to quit that lifestyle was why my mom left him before I was born. I saw him on weekends and summers, every other holiday, if he showed up or wasn't in jail. And it was the exact opposite at his house from my mother's house. My mother and my grandma were upper middle class and well-educated. My grandfather was the warden at a federal prison locally, and my grandmother the dean at the College of Education at a university about an hour away. Because my mom's position with the DCFS had her leaving to investigate child abuse at all hours of the night, my grandma's was my second home. Compared to this, the freewheeling, drug dealing at my dad's was a whole different world. A world I knew I had to keep a secret from my mom, my grandma, my friends, a secret from everyone. I am my mother's only child, but I am the third of 11 that we know of on my dad's side. I was the first child of whom he was aware of his role as a father and whose birth he was aware of or acknowledged. Neither he nor any of his family attended my birth nor have they attended any of my other life events. Not one, and I am 38 years old. My mom's family, however, followed me around with a camera like the paparazzi, documenting every step of my life. The first two of my father's kids, my older brother Josh and my sister Shelly, respectively, were apparently conceived on a whim during his days in the Army in the late 1970s and early 1980s. He received a dishonorable discharge and came home to Texarkana only to find my mom, his high school sweetheart, freshly home from graduating at KU. My father was engaged to another woman, my stepmom, but apparently he was a bit unfaithful to both her and my mother, leading both women on and impregnating both. He brags his kids are the colors of the rainbow because all of us have mothers of a different race. Pretty much, he's a classic dirtbag. We haven't spoken since 2014, when I filed the first police report on my ex-husband at the behest of the warden at the sheriff's department where I was employed. After college, my story was much the same. I'd known Tally all through my formative years, from age 13 when we first met at my dad's. He was skateboarding in the driveway with my brothers Devin and Jared, while my younger sisters Emmy and Monique watched them get hurt and laughed. The boys had a sleepover, and he and I stayed friends until I graduated from college at Sam Houston in 2007. Shortly thereafter, I transferred from the state prison system in Texas to the sheriff's department on the Arkansas side of town to pursue my career. I eloped with Tally. It was his idea but I did pay for it all since he was gainfully unemployed, in March of 2008. In January of the following year, our son Ali was born, prematurely, at only 28 weeks. And even though he was a preemie, he was, and still is, giant. 6 pounds, 13 ounces, and 19 inches long. He was so premature, he hadn't fully developed his lungs. Surfectant was sprayed into his nasal cavity, and he spent a while in the NICU. Tally was, well, who the hell knows where Tally was? My father showed up after my labor was induced, and they both disappeared together, and both stayed gone for some months afterwards. By the time my son was born, Tally had already started the typical abuser cycle, separating me from family and friends, berating me, in controlling our finances, of which I was the primary breadwinner. Physical abuse was also a regular occurrence by the time of my son's birth, if he was around. My eyes are visibly black and my nose broken in a photo of my grandma, my mom, and my son on his first Christmas. The physical abuse started small, 
But by the time it started, I had already normalized the behavior of covering for his reasons for keeping me from my mother and the sorority sisters. It's too far to drive. He had moved us to a house in the country, and it took half an hour drive to get to a red light. I don't have gas money. I earned the most of both of us. He was employed with a local nonprofit that serves food banks in the area. Even though we had a combined income of over 40000 a year, I didn't have $5 for gas because I wasn't allowed to access the finances without his prior permission. There was no company allowed in our home. He had cameras set up inside and outside the house and on the pasture gate, which was always padlocked from the outside if he wasn't home, even if I was home. The driveway past the gate was over two miles long to the house, so there was literally no way out. I did not have a key to the padlock. I was allowed to go to work, but Tally had to see a copy of my schedule first. He compared it to the hours on my pay stub every month to ensure I wasn't lying about my whereabouts. He even set up a GPS on the computer in my truck. I found this out many years after the fact, and it explained a lot. He was tracking my movements outside the house. Tally always set my phone up until I got a department issue cell phone, and he had access to all of my calls and messages. That department issue phone may have eventually saved my life. I told nobody about any of this. My brother started to notice something was off. However, shortly after my son was born, Devin had married and had a son about three months after Ali's birth, and we made plans to get our babies together and take photos in the giant pasture in front of my house. The blue bonnets were blooming, and the sunny spring weather was perfect. He came to my house way out in the boonies, only to find his big sister and nephew padlocked inside her own house like Rapunzel. Since Tally never allowed me to cut my hair short, my brother started to refer to me as Rapunzel if they needed to make any plans relevant to me that Tally may need not know. They knew before I did that they would have to plan for some time to help me get out of this situation safely. However, as we all found out the hard way, You cannot plan for crazy. Crazy, it's just that. It's effing crazy. It's like herding feral cats or ocean water. You just can't plan for it. Crazy does what it wants to. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and Murphy's law at the same time. It's going to be weird and probably horrible. So no matter what you plan for, Something far worse and way more unexpected both can and always will happen whenever you're dealing with a madman. I recall having an abject feeling of shock the first time he hit me with a closed fist. But looking back, I realize now that he had been building up to that type of violence from the very start. My relationship with him prior to our marriage had been primarily platonic and my experience with relationships had not encompassed violence in any capacity. Control, yes. Verbal and psychological abuse from ex-boyfriends in college? Absolutely. But not physical violence. I'd been involved with two prior serious relationships as an adultish version of myself in college, and those were vastly different from the puppy love high school sweethearts that I had grown up with two, respectively, with whom I'm still close to this day. Being in a violent romantic relationship to me was unthinkable for myself at the time of my marriage, in spite of all the factors in my short experiences with adult relationships leading directly to such an encounter without therapeutic intervention, which I both denied needing and refused to get much like most potential victims in such circumstances. My memory of the first time I was punched by him is somehow both vivid and foggy at the same time. Tally reappeared at my house about 12 weeks after my son was born, after being missing with my father the entire time. 
When he arrived at my house, I was holding Ollie and playing Tekken, a versus fighter video game. I'd played video games my whole life. My mother and a few friends opened a side business when I was a little girl that was a video arcade called Silver Ball, and so video games had always been a huge part of my life. I had never thought that there was anything about playing a game that would cause a discrepancy with my partner at all past a simple tiff about a misunderstanding of the rules or perhaps competitive baiting. Never did I expect something so mundane to cause such a monumental argument or moment in my adult life. Upon crossing the threshold of the house, Tally spotted me sitting on the couch with a PlayStation 3 controller in my hands, our son on my lap between my arms as I played, the baby laughing along with me. The doorway darkened and his shadow was elongated across the cherry hardwood floors, showing a sinister contrast to the sunbeams illuminating the room through the screen door. My brothers had cut the deadbolt on the pasture gate with bolt cutters, allowing me to come and go as I pleased, and I had completely let that slip my mind altogether in the weeks of his absence. It was the first thing he had noticed upon returning to our property, the missing lock. By the time he had driven the entirety of our kilometer-long serpentine driveway, he was livid. I had no idea. He was drunk had a bottle of Evan in his right hand and a cigarette between his sneering lips, brown eyes completely black with rage. His bald spot, in the shape of a cul-de-sac even at 25, was as red as his face. He reached into his right jeans front pocket and pulled out a glass meth pipe. I remember yelling. I was adamant about hating drugs because of my father and his lifestyle but I don't remember much about him crossing the room after I yelled, or even what I said. I remember it was about his absence, the blatant use of drugs in front of me and our infant son, but somehow after that, the next thing I remember is being dragged across the living room floor. Somehow in the midst of the yelling, he had grabbed the controller and wrapped the cord around my neck. I fell to the ground as he punched me in the gut directly between our son's legs. I gripped my child for dear life as he dragged me, clutching my infant down the hall into the nursery. He was punching me in the face, neck, and chest. He was kicking me as he punched me. He locked us inside, pushing a full bookcase in front of the door to prevent my escape. I had no formula for my son, only a few diapers in the drawers beneath the changing table, and no way of telling time except the inevitable hungry cries of my baby. We stayed in that room overnight. He let us out at sunrise, holding a fresh bottle for my son and an ice pack for me. He was caring, wiping my bloody lips. I knew it was a farce. I also knew that he had been up the entire night smoking more meth and drinking heavily, so I played along in hopes that it may buy me a bit of peace. I learned to normalize this too, finding ways to explain missed calls for extended times if he so felt inclined to lock us in a room again, which he most certainly did. Learning to use various concealer colors to hide the ever more frequent bruising. Sometimes, after I returned to work after taking family leave for the birth of my son, I would get lucky and there would be an altercation at work with an offender, and in those cases, the bruises could be explained away as a work thing and I didn't have to hide them. My co-workers were more astute at spotting differences in my behavior and also more vocal in speaking up about my exceedingly more and more visible bruises and fat lips. My grandmother died of a stroke on Christmas Day in 2010, shortly after her retirement from South Arkansas University. Tally did not attend her funeral, nor was he in contact with any of my maternal family. He spoke with both his father and my father on a nearly daily basis. However, Her death led to the inevitable dissolution of my maternal family's regular traditions and norms, 
and lessened my already infrequent contact with them. This gave Tally more opportunities to exercise control, and the widening distance between myself and my mother, her siblings, my own siblings, and of course my few remaining friends gave me fewer and fewer places to turn for help. Ali started pre-K a year later, and I got permission from Tally to return to college. He decided to start college at my insistence, taking his first two undergraduate years at a local community college, while I started my first graduate hours at a local statewide university system branch. We both had to keep working to be able to afford our mortgage and other bills. However, the distraction of making personal progress seemed to put a buffer between myself and Tally's temper. With my classes and labs and his full 12-hour course load and full-time jobs for both of us, we saw little of one another. The summer breaks, I kept busy enrolled in an extra course with a lab for two successive summers, and Ali would spend those hours with the only members of my maternal family with whom I was allowed to contact after my grandmother's death, my Aunt Teresa and Uncle Kevin. Both my aunt and uncle knew exactly what was happening at my house behind closed doors, and while they never breathed the word of that knowledge to Tally, they told me every time they saw me that whenever I decided to ask for help, they would be there, and they would be ready to help both me and Ali in any way they could, and they kept that promise. After Tally finished his second year of college, he decided he was done. And when he did so, he apparently decided the same for me, unbeknownst to me. In the summer of 2014, we bought a farm with 88 acres of land that contained two creeks and several fish stock ponds in a small town adjacent to Texarkana, Arkansas. The farmhouse, while in a very rural area, was actually closer to my job at the sheriff's department in the Arkansas side. And being an Arkansas resident would also prevent state income taxes from being taken out of my pay. So moving from the Texas side of town had several advantages. The downside was that I was even farther from not only my family, but society at large. The turnoff for the dirt road that served as our driveway was 14 miles from city limits of Texarkana and the nearest house to mine was over two miles away. My driveway itself was also, and yet again, two miles of serpentine dirt, this time heavily wooded, thus rendering the house invisible from the highway. The turnoff into the driveway was across the two-lane highway from the mailbox, with only two small reflectors near the ground to mark the turn. And after dark, anyone who had to try to find that tiny driveway often ended up in the drainage ditch that ran next to the highway. There were no streetlights for miles, and the highway was pitch black after dark. Tally found this remoteness an advantage to his sadistic tendencies. I had no idea the hell that lay in store for myself or my son after buying that farmhouse. I fell in love with the quaint wraparound screened-in porch and the wildlife. Tally saw an opportunity to exercise the control he had always wanted. I, too, had other motives. The move would give me a new ability that I didn't have in Texas, a legal ability in regards to domestic assault arrests, which applied to me directly. I planned to make good use of this ability. I thought it would be easy, though, and it wasn't. After finding out the hard way by using the personal documents that were kept inside a fire safe, you know, birth certificates for myself and Ollie, both my social security card and my son's, high school diploma and transcripts, sealed college transcripts, etc., Tally had gone online and withdrawn me from my college classes. Things went from bad to worse in a very short time frame. It was the first semester of the final year of my graduate degree, which I had slowly worked toward every year since Ali entered pre-K at age three. I was devastated, and my attention span at work began to suffer. 
Not only that, but Talia had increased the frequency in going on his marathon meth benders. Staying gone for weeks on end with my dad and showing up drunk and spun on dope randomly at home. I scheduled my work hours to coincide with Ali's school since his presence wasn't to be relied upon. The times he was gone, the days at the farm were idyllic. Ali and I took evening hikes in the woodland between the creeks in the front 44 acres of the farm. The back half consisted of the stock ponds and the pasture land that I leased to a nearby cattle and goat farmer. Ali and I grew vegetables, built a fort behind the farmhouse for him to play in, and spent hours exploring the woods. When Tally was around, life was totally different. I had to have supper on the table when he arrived home at six from work at the food bank. No matter what happened at work or if Ali had an after-school activity like football or Cub Scouts, any deviation from this time frame resulted in first yelling, then throwing whatever was closest to him, and then it always got worse. The worst time I can remember, he grabbed me by my bun tied at the nape of my neck and pulled me across the kitchen floor by my hair then proceeded to bash my head into the wall in the pantry until he smashed my face through the drywall and into a stud. I spat the blood pooling in my mouth at his feet, and being a smartass, asked him, If you can't be taller than me, at least you can use me as a stud finder, huh? That really pissed him off. I had been finishing supper whenever he walked in the door, but I didn't have it on the table. He was very particular about what he considered to be his rules for me, especially about that and his height, or lack thereof, and his ever-increasing male pattern baldness. The entirety of our marriage, he never allowed me to wear heels, since I'm 5'10 and he stopped growing at 5'7" so he felt quite emasculated whenever I wore anything but flats. The verbal jab about his height after my perceived tardiness with his supper sent his meth-addled brain into a frenzy of rage. The redness of his paper-white skin spread up his pencil neck, past the veins throbbing at his bald temples, and spread to his scalp. He began to sputter angrily and then grabbed my buns again. Ali, who was six at the time, was watching in shock. He had seen Tally hit me before, but never anything this bad. Ali had grabbed my phone at some point and was frantically trying to dial 911, like he had been taught to do in an emergency by his kindergarten teacher, Aunt T, and myself. Tally saw him. I screamed, begging him not to hurt our son. Tally snatched the phone from Ali and proceeded to smash it into bits on the floor. Try calling her effing friends at the cop shop now, you little bastard. You're going to snitch? You raised him to effing snitch? How dare you? What's next? Who's next? Your dad? You did this, you effing bitch. He punched me once more that I can remember, for good measure, I suppose, and then I remember nothing. Lights out. I came to some hours later in that same pantry. The first place I headed was to Ollie's room and found him there in bed, fast asleep. I crawled in bed next to my son, and the next morning when we woke up, Tally was gone again, thankfully. The next time I saw him was weeks later, when I was in the drive through line to pick up my son from school. In the interim, I had been approached by my department psychologist, who asked me if things were okay at home, and knowing that he would know if I lied, I told him that they most certainly were not. He informed me that he was directed to ask me by my commanding officer, who had noticed not only changes in my behavior, but bruises. He set up a meeting with me for the next day, and I spilled my guts. About 
everything. Some days later, I was called into a meeting with the county sheriff, the jail warden, and the department psychologist. The warden, being my direct boss, let me know in no short words why I was there, but I already knew. Then the sheriff broke in, speaking in a soft southern draw. Now, Rachel, we're family here at this department. I don't like worrying about one of mine, whether they're under this roof, in the field, or at home. I never have to worry about you when you're here under this roof or on the field, but every damn time you clock out, I worry that you won't be here the next time. And don't think it's your performance. Stop making that face. It's not. I worry because you and that boy of yours may not make it to the next morning if that piece of shit you call a husband shows up. You need to file a police report. Do it today. Clock out and do it now. Or myself and Warden Brazel here are going to have to file one for your safety. So file I did. It was the first time. The Sheriff's Department has never had a lot of deputies. Since the county has both a small budget and an even smaller population, and the sheriff made sure to make the most of the hiring budget he was given. Luckily, I was assigned to give my written report to a really kind and helpful female patrol deputy who did her best to make a very awkward, for me at least, situation be as comfortable as it could be. She had to photograph my bruises all over my body. I got a referral to a legal service to help me file for a divorce and to start work on a protective order. And she and I both knew that this was the beginning of the most dangerous part, separation. I was assigned a detective to my case, and yet again, it was a colleague. I felt utterly humiliated. I was so embarrassed that my coworkers, but especially my sheriff, had seen what I had considered to be the worst part of me. Even though, from the first time I filed a report and several times since my eventual separation, I was reassured repeatedly by colleagues that they neither held me responsible for the behavior of my ex-husband, nor did it lessen their opinions of me. In spite of those assurances, however, I still did, and sometimes still do, blame myself, which is one part of why I'm still in therapy. Tally was waiting for me some weeks later as I waited in line to pick up Holly from first grade. He was attending the same engineering magnet school where he had gone to kindergarten, and Tally was familiar with the drop-off and pickup procedures. I got to the front of the line, and a faculty member approached the passenger window to check my pickup badge which lets the teacher know which kid to get you if they don't recognize you. I hit the unlock button on my door panel, and the back door opened on the passenger side as the teacher helped get my son in and buckle him up. I pulled around the corner, and there he stood. Before I could get the door lock button pushed, he rushed the door open, not wanting to make a scene at my son's school. I just started to slowly hit the gas. Hopeful he would let go and give up, but he hopped in, shut the door, and locked it. I should have made a scene. He reached down and pulled up his t-shirt, showing me a pistol butt. Drive and act like everything is fine. As long as you drive and act like it's fine, it will be. Now we want everything okay, don't we, for the boy? Yes, okay, I'll do it for Oliver. I stammered, but I knew that nothing would be okay, not after that, not for a while, if we lived through it. By that time, I had received two department-issued cell phones from work, one for while I was transporting offenders to court or another jail, and another for when I was on call at the jail or dispatch. Ollie had gotten in the habit of taking the one that I wasn't using at the time with him to school in his backpack in case of emergencies, and he used it. He dialed 911. Even at age six, he knew that utter discretion was in order for our survival. He had put in headphones with a mic 
and locked the screen after he dialed. He didn't say a word. He just let the call roll and kept his headphones in. The call connected to the local police department since we were inside the city limits at the time. And shortly after he dialed 911, Tally made a request. Stop after we pass your cop shop at the liquor store. I need some Evan. I drove the short distance between the elementary and then turned onto the highway on which was my job, my home, and the liquor shop. By the time I reached the liquor store, I knew Ollie was on a call with 911. I stopped in the gravel parking lot, staring across the street at the sheriff's department, and he ruined my plan to run across the street when he made his next demand. Hit the drive through I see you looking. Keep your dumbass eyes pointed on the road. Pay attention to driving like a good mother. I went to the drive through lane and he ordered. While I wondered if the dispatchers at By State had transferred the call, the call to Miller, I prayed. He finished his cash transaction and instructed me to keep driving toward the house, and I did. I then tried to make a left turn into the jail Sally Port driveway at the county sheriff's department. Tally realized mid-swallow what was happening and grabbed the wheel, somehow managing to get the cap on his precious whiskey while he jerked the car from the passenger seat. He reached into his waistband, then stopped, and held the pistol and whipped me with the butt while jerking the wheel. My expedition rocked on two wheels as it swerved into the oncoming traffic on the two-lane highway. In the midst of all this, Ollie's headphones came out of the jack on his phone, and the audio of the dispatcher rang out on the car speaker. Where's your location, ma'am? This is Texarkana, Arkansas PD. Where are you? Tally reached into the back seat and grabbed the phone from our son's hands, jerking so hard the child's curls bounced. He ended the call. You're mine now, you dirty cunt. You taught him this. You made him this way. Now turn into the driveway and park this piece of shit. I turned into the gravel driveway and slowly eased the SUV down the twists and the turns of the driveway. My foot shaking on the pedal, sweaty legs through the wooden slacks of my uniform pants, sticking to the leather of the seat. Ollie's normally olive-toned face was white with fear. He stared out the window in the back seat behind me, his eyes wide, unblinking. I eased my shaking foot onto the brake, trying to keep control of my motor skills and the vehicle. Telly hopped from the still-moving car. I parked and got out, unsure of my fate. He held the confiscated phone in one hand and lit a cigarette. He smiled, then walked to the pine tree stump near the well house to the left where I had parked and proceeded to smash it on the tree stump. He then walked to the passenger door, grabbed my purse, and removed the other phone, my personal phone, and work laptop. All got the same treatment as the first. He gathered the broken electronic parts and tossed them into the pasture. He walked to me as I sprinted toward the porch with my son, keys clutched in my hand. Telly's slow strides seemed underwater to me as Ali and I ran for the porch. I still can't figure out how he managed to reach us before we got inside, but he did. He grabbed me by the throat and dragged me to the well house, and I started screaming, knowing that there was no way anyone except my son and Tally could hear. The only neighbors were miles away. I still had the keys to my house and the car gripped in my hand. He threw me into the front of the well house, my spine smashing into the padlock closure for the well pump housed inside. Go inside, Allie, he yelled, and Allie did as he was asked. I heard his zipper. I had a sick, stirring feeling in my gut about what he might do next, 
but reality set in immediately as he ripped the fasteners on my utility work belt and began, began to yank down my slacks. I headbutted him in the mouth, and he pushed me back down. He wrenched my knees apart. I felt ripping inside me, and he spit in my face as he finished the job. He smashed my head into the wellhouse door, and my vision started to swim. The nest of ground hornets that had colonized beneath the pump began to hum. I somehow thought that someone was running water inside. I didn't know it was more pain coming for me. The hornets swarmed, and Tally's allergy to the flying assailants caused him to run and scream like a girl. He forgot all about me as the hornets attacked me. He went to where Ali was, inside. I waited for the swarm to stop, slapping flying bugs all over myself, hitting bruises that were formed rapidly from being dragged across the yard. As I struggled to get on all fours, then to stand, I heard a car horn. It startled me. It made me jump, causing pain to shoot all over my body. I looked up to find my father and Tally's dad, Wayne, in a black Cadillac CTS. Tally came out of the house and ran across the porch, hopped in back, and he disappeared again for several more weeks, until after Halloween. I then understood all too well how he had arrived at the elementary school. This was planned, and I just saw with whom. I was appalled, but not shocked. My father had never been the most loving. I went inside and found Ali shaking. I asked if he had hurt him. He told me no, his green eyes filling with tears. He didn't hurt my body, but it hurts, Mom. Let's go to your job. We need police. Please, Mom. I listened to the request. I went, and I filed my second report. The third and final report I filed was the worst incident, the worst time I encountered him, and the worst thing that I think has ever happened to myself or my son. We had gone a while without seeing or hearing from him, and although I knew he may show up at any time, Allie and I had slipped into a routine of life without him in the interim. Halloween passed uneventfully. Ali dressed as an adorable but very tall Dracula trick-or-treated with classmates and spent the night munching candy or playing video games, even though he constantly urged me to play video games with him. I always refused, and still haven't either, since he was too little, thankfully, to remember what happened when he was a baby. It was a few nights past Halloween, and I was on call for work so I was trying to stay awake until midnight when my time was up. I started to chat on the phone with an old girlfriend. I'd lock the doorknob to the front door and back doors, but not the deadbolts, figuring that since Tali had been out of sight without his vehicle that he didn't have his keys. I was wrong. I went into the bathroom adjacent to the kitchen and Ollie's room at the side of the house. I then went through the kitchen French doors into the living room, to find Tali's silhouette blacked out by the white fluorescent light of the porch light. He had a liter bottle of Evan Williams in one hand. He held his Zippo lighter in the other hand. Honey, I'm home, he cried and smiled at me wild-eyed. About that time, my friend said, I'm calling the fucking cops now. What's your house number? I told her my house number and that I had to go, but Tally quickly grabbed the phone from my hand, wanting to know who I was talking to. He wanted to know if it was my girlfriend or if it was my new man. He pulled his favorite move and snatched the phone out of my hand. Hi, is this Bree? He asked. I heard a litany of swearing from the other end of the phone. Then the call disconnected from the other end. He slipped it into his front jeans pocket. Ali had woken up by that time and stood in his doorway holding the blankie that he had had since he was born and still slept with at the time. 
His golden curls were mussed from sleep, his cheeks red, and his jaw dropped into a silent scream. We locked eyes, and then both my son and myself looked at the coffee table, upon which rested my keys. We both began a mad dash toward the table. Tally gathered his senses to realize what we were doing by swigging his whiskey. I grabbed the keys and ran to the door, and my son was already halfway through the front yard, dashing towards the passenger side of my waiting SUV. Tally met me at the door and pushed me down inside the threshold of the house in a bizarre reversal newlywed ritual. I reached up between his legs, grabbing his scrotum and squeezing with my right hand, holding my keys in my left. He fell backwards and plopped onto the planks of the porch on his butt. I don't remember putting shoes on, but somehow I had them on and I scrambled my feet and was running in Uggs towards the SUV. Ollie, already seated and smartly buckled up in the back seat, blankie in hand, Hit it, Mom, he yelled, and I jumped in, thinking I was home free. Tally jumped in the front passenger seat next to me and started to punch me in the head as I started the truck. I gassed it. I took the curves of the driveway as fast as I could without having a rollover accident and turned left onto the dark waiting highway. Hopefully I could make it a few miles to the nearest, whatever, maybe a sheriff's department, without dying with this crazy asshole in the car with me. Tally had other plans and yanked the wheel. The SUV tanked out in the ditch next to the road, stuck high center. It would need a tow truck. Allie and I both jumped out into the muddy ditch water. We found that Tally was nowhere to be seen. We started running down the driveway. About halfway, Allie's legs started to hurt. I grabbed him and his blankie and kept running. At six, he was a robust 85 pounds and four five. It was not easy to carry him anymore. Neither of us cared. I kept running, bare feet slipping on the sheepskin wool inside my boots. The old car I had from college was our only way out at this point. I rarely drove it because the windows didn't roll down properly and it was, well, super old. Allie jokingly called it the doo-doo monster because it was such a piece of crap. It was parked beneath the security light in the front yard, which shined upon it like some fluorescent beacon of hope. When I reached the driver's door, I put Allie down and found the key on my key ring, unlocked the door, letting out a musty smell. It had been sitting there a while, but it cranked right up and we whooped with glee. I backed it up and then put my foot on the brake to change gears and to drive, and Tally was next to my window like some devilish apparition. He may have been hiding in the woods, or the tree line, or just behind the house. The property was so vast and wooded, he could have come from just about anywhere. Who knows? He brandished a metal, rusty red and white rectangular can with a yellow squirt nozzle in his left hand and retched the already broken window down with the other. He reached inside the window, shoved it askew and off track, and opened the door from the inside. And then I found out what was in the can. He sprayed me, the steering wheel, my son in the passenger seat with barbecue lighter fluid. He then lit his Zippo lighter and tossed it inside the car into my lap. The saturated seatbelt and steering wheel went up in flames with an audible whoosh, and I tasted the lighter fluid, burnt hair, and burnt plastic. The car rolled to a stop into the pole of the security light, and Ollie jumped out as I dragged myself onto the cool, waiting ground. I rolled the flames out. We started walking down the highway. Ollie reached into his basketball shorts and said, Look what he dropped and handed me a phone. My phone. Thank you, son. I dialed 911 as we walked down the dark, foggy highway at 1 a.m. We walked for what felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was only about two miles. I stayed on the phone with dispatch at the emergency department, which I was employed because I was outside city limits. 
until I saw headlights that I knew to be those of a patrol deputy. And then I saw another set. They meant business. The deputy, a tall, toe-headed guy, bundled us into his back seat with a blanket, but rolled the windows down. He radioed an ambulance since I had burns on my neck, chest, face, back, and abdomen. Ollie, by some miracle, only got sore legs and a stanky blanky, as he put it, always my comic relief. He was mentally scarred deeply, however. He, too, is still in therapy. The deputies escorted us to my mom's house that night. They searched the property, but he was nowhere to be found. Tally wasn't arrested for another two years. During that time, he stalked myself and our son. Watching him play on the playground at school and leaving creepy Hanukkah gifts on my mom's porch. On September 17, 2017, three years after the car fire, he was sentenced to five years in prison and was let out after serving only 15 months in August of 2020, with the parole board citing COVID as the reason for his early release. I spoke to the parole board in person to petition for his continued incarceration, but it didn't get me anywhere. He was released anyway. I resigned from the sheriff's department about a month after the car fire. I was far too injured to work at the time, physically. Now, I just couldn't go back to work as a correctional officer because I have complex PTSD. I was awarded a no contact and protection order for not only myself, but for Ollie too, which is kind of rare for those to be awarded to children, especially in the case of a parent. But the presiding judge commented that his reason was the severe and violent nature of the case. I have never awarded one of these for a child in my 25 years on the bench, but I will today. And that order lasts until March 2027. I don't feel as if I have gotten real justice. His release was far too soon, but I'm just bidding my time. He will screw up his freedom in one way or another, and then maybe I'll have just another 15 months without looking over my shoulder every time I leave the house. I'm going to stay in therapy and keep raising my son the best that I can. He has skipped two grades and will be starting ninth grade in the fall of 2022. He is also a strapping 6'5" and won't be 13 years old until January of 2022. He's still growing fast. I have a loving partner who loves Ali and is super supportive of both of us. And my relationship with my mom is better now than it has been in years. I own heels and listen to punk rock without getting slapped. And Ali and I even both have dogs now, both rescues like ourselves. So things are getting better every day, but not all days are easy. My PTSD has made every day life hard, and I've had to learn a lot of coping skills to do even regular things like grocery shopping or getting gas without having a panic attack. It does get easier every day, and with all this love that surrounds Ali and me, it can only get better. I couldn't have gotten out without help. If you know someone you think is in a violent relationship, don't hesitate to ask if everything is okay. If you see something violent or dangerous, don't be afraid to report it to authorities, even if it's anonymous. You may save somebody's life. I want to thank Rachel for having the strength and bravery to tell us her story. I think that this story really shows the way domestic abuse escalates. At the beginning, everything is fine, and then things slowly start to escalate. And when they do, it can be a very difficult situation to get out of. I hope that Rachel's story can help show others who have survived domestic abuse that they are not alone. I hope that it shows other women who are currently experiencing domestic abuse, that you can get out. It may be hard, but you can do it.
And finally, I hope Rachel's story helps others who are in their healing process know that even though it takes time, you can and will heal and move on with your life and be happy. Domestic violence knows no race, gender, financial status, or culture. Anyone can be a victim and everyone is affected. Stay safe. Evil people are everywhere. And please support those that you know that are going through domestic abuse. They need it. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Copy, Murder, and Mystery. You can find us on the web at www.coffeemurderandmystery.com. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And we also have a YouTube channel. All references for today's podcast are available in our show notes. If you enjoyed our show, please consider giving us an Apple Podcast five-star rating, sharing our show with your friends, and leaving a review. This helps us by allowing more people to find our show. If you would like to support our show with a financial contribution, please consider joining our Patreon. Joining our Patreon at the $5 level will give you a bonus episode on the second week of the month, as well as a second bonus episode on the fourth week of the month. Or go to buymeacoffee.com for a one-time contribution. We appreciate all of our listeners. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. Thank you so much for listening. The information provided in this podcast is solely of our opinion and based upon research that we have conducted via the internet. If you feel that we have represented something inaccurately or unfairly, you can send us an email at coffeemurdermystery at gmail.com. Thanks for your support.